Welcome to Across the Dietary Universe, a podcast where we bring experts along our voyage to discover the secrets of food and how it relates to each of our unique dietary profiles. From the origins of diets to current eating trends to the frontier of food innovation and the future of how we eat, we'll discover that when it comes to food, Things are not necessarily as they seem. Okay, Megan, it's so nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining the Across the Dietary Universe podcast. Um, And we're very excited to have you here. And for our listeners, Megan Ashley, a.k.a. It's All About AIP as an educator, a certified holistic nutritional consultant and health coach helping those with autoimmune health issues improve their health through nutrition. As you'll hear in her story... She's used an AIP diet, which is autoimmune protocol, to greatly improve her health and quality of life. And she's now an expert in creating AIP compliant meals. Thanks so much for being here, Megan. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. And I can't wait to chat with you guys. Awesome. So, I mean, when I'm going through all of this, you know, in my company, we look at a lot of diets. Okay, so I'm a little bit familiar with these diets, but I think for the listeners, it can sometimes be overwhelming um, with the number of diets that are out there. For example, there's AIP, there's low FODMAP, there's, you know, paleo AIP. Um, Can you sort of define first before we get because I want to get into your journey, I want to get into the dark side and the good side and the ups and the downs. But before we do that, why don't we just define Um, In your words, if you don't mind for the listeners, what exactly is AIP and how does it differ or compare to low FODMAP, for example, and and to paleo? Yeah, so the paleo autoimmune protocol, because the autoimmune protocol is slightly different from the paleo version of it. So the diet that I specifically work with is the paleo autoimmune protocol. And essentially when I'm explaining it to people who are like new to it or have never heard it, I'm like, okay, it's like a stricter version of a paleo diet. So if you think of a paleo diet as sort of, you know, the way that cavemen used to eat the idea that we haven't, you know, evolved enough to be sort of eating all of these processed foods, let's try to stick with, you know, what our ancestors would have eaten. Um, But basically a paleo autoimmune protocol is a diet that is going to reduce all of the inflammatory foods. So lots of foods have inflammation or cause inflammation, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad for all people. (laughs) They're typically just not great for those of us that already have a lot of inflammation in our body. So for example, tomatoes, that's something that a lot of people think is like healthy, you know, it's got lots of vitamins and nutrients in it, but for somebody with autoimmune disease, it can be very problematic because they cause a lot of inflammation in the body. So this diet basically just removes all foods that science says can cause inflammation in the body for a period of time, typically 30 to 90 days, sometimes longer. Um, And then basically we try to reintroduce those foods strategically one at a time to test the immune system and see if we get a response or not. Because of course, what's different uh, for one person, so one person might be having an issue with tomatoes, the other person might be fine. So it's a very strategic diet. And I sort of say it's the gold standard in food allergy testing. So if you've ever had food allergy testing, often we get a lot of false positives. Um, This one is basically the gold standard. It's going to give you the best idea of what foods you can tolerate and which ones you can't. I see. I'm just confused why my, you know, dietitian back in the day didn't, uh, they basically offered me low FODMAP, but they didn't Mm -hmm. offer me AIP. And I was diagnosed with colitis, um, I don't know, like eight years ago now. Uh, and right. that, that wasn't an, an option at the time. So is there sometimes like a choice between do we do AIP or do we do low FODMAP as far as a recommendation? So different doctors do definitely have different, you know, favorites or diets even that they're just more familiar with. Um, I would say, you know, eight years ago, AIP was still quite new to, you know, the, <laughs> the mainstream. Uh, there wasn't a lot of recipes out there. So it could also just be that your doctor wasn't familiar uh, right. with that diet. Low FODMAP, I typically recommend for people that have SIBO. So a lot of people that have autoimmune disease, obviously, there's usually some other sort of underlying thing that's going on. Uh, so they might have an autoimmune disease, but they might also have SIBO, or they might have candida overgrowth, or some sort of infection that's causing a lot of their symptoms or preventing them from being able to eat a wider variety of foods. So sometimes it's not even that those foods are causing us inflammation, it's that we're not digesting them properly because of some other underlying issue. So low FODMAP is basically reducing certain foods that break down 
uh, into sugars in a certain way, because those foods feed the sugars like the bad bacteria in the intestine. So that's probably just the diet that she was most familiar with, which would help, but there are a lot of foods on the low FODMAP diet that are not great for people with autoimmune disease. Right. So it's good to do this diet um, just to sort of rule out uh, if you have autoimmune disease, which foods you can tolerate and which ones you can't. And that will change over the course of your lifetime, depending on um, how healthy you are, where your inflammation levels are at, how well you're managing your autoimmune disease. Right. And so uh, AIP, for example, so when you say paleo AIP, you're saying it's just a more advanced version of, of paleo, for example. Yeah, it's basically just based on the current research that is going to help reduce inflammation in the body. It cuts out all foods that can cause inflammation that we know, right? Right, Because this is still an ever-changing industry. But basically what the foods that scientists have tested, these are the ones that are most likely to cause inflammation in people. So we're going to remove them to sort of bring your immune system back down to like what I call like your base level. Right. So how you function on a regular every day without you causing any more inflammation on your own. <laughs> right. And, so and, and the way there. to, the way to do that, yeah. you're saying is also you have to, it's, it's individual at the same time, right? Very individual. Yeah. Got it. And that's why it's a protocol. It's not a diet necessarily. Yeah. I mean, like I didn't really know any of these things when I started seven years ago, I just thought like, okay, this is the diet. Here's the list. Yes. And no, um, do it. But I made so many mistakes along the way. And it took me so much longer to get to a point where I felt really good that that's why I decided to start working with people because I felt like, um, you need someone to help you navigate. And as you're saying, a lot of doctors are not familiar. I have so many clients that reach out to me and they're like, so my doctor told me to go AIP, but he doesn't know anything about AIP. Can you help? Yeah. Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and in their defense, I mean, especially Western medicine doctors, I mean, they receive one nutrition like course in seven years. So yeah, I don't get that. I don't understand that. That doesn't make, I know. We, yeah, we can't expect them to be experts on, on, on diet. And so really, I think you have to go into that knowing, cause a lot of people will say, well, my doctor said I could just continue to eat how I eat. It's like, they're not the experts on that. They are experts in certain areas, but food um, and lifestyle is definitely not their area of expertise. Yeah. I, I find it very frustrating sometimes actually with, um, with my, and I love, I love my GI doctor, but they're switching me at the moment to uh, some new people. So they don't really know who I am. They don't really know the journey. They just kind of have the file and that's it. But for me, like I worked really hard to get into remission uh, without having to take heavier medication. Right. So right. I'm on like pretty low, you know, dosage of like the lowest, you know, possible drug, for example, or the least severe drug. And to me that I worked really hard for that. Like I, I, did all these things. I made adjustments to my diet, exercise, sleep, whatever it might be. Um, and then sometimes you have cheat days and sometimes you have the holidays that come up. And uh, if your next checkup happens to be right after the holidays, you know, it's not going to look very good. And, and for them, they don't really like it when you're in. And by the way, I'm not trying to disparage uh, Western medicine or doctors. I love doctors. Great. Excellent. I'm just saying <laughs> in, in um, you know, in that uh, when you're in flux and you're not here nor there necessarily, they want to put you in a bucket. They mm -hmm. want to say you're this treatment or you're that treatment. We don't like it when you're in between the treatments. Um, and that part, I think, is a little bit frustrating for me because it's like, well, I want the opportunity to heal naturally. And I know that I can, but it, it doesn't necessarily fit the system um, and it becomes a, a real issue, I, I think, for cousins. And that's probably a lot of the stories of how you end up getting clients, right? Because people are feeling stuck or maybe they don't even get a diagnosis. I know you wrote that you were super happy when you got your diagnosis because finally it's like a relief that you know what the heck is going on, right? Yeah, that's so true, you know. And typically I actually work mostly with clients um, out of the States um, and so they seem to be a little bit further on this journey than here in Canada, mm -hmm. um, in sort of their awareness of this diet. Um, and it's typically because they have, you know, the choice where they can pay for, for healthcare. So they can go to a functional medicine practitioner or a specific doctor, um, that's going to help them. So they get specific testing for their thyroid, and then they're told to go on a diet, uh, like AIP, right. um, here in Canada, I mean, you know, the process it's like to see a specialist, it's like, you're going to your general doctor. And then, you know, like it's a lot of, a lot of hoops to jump through. And then there are often people that don't really know you 
Um, and it's really hard to find somebody who is even going to be open to the idea that you might have changed your circumstance through something other than medication, right? So I'm sort of in this weird uh, fate, which is good, where I actually don't need medication. So I've actually never been on medication wow. for any of my autoimmune diseases, aside from my most recent one. Um, and so they basically, when I go to like a regular um, general practitioner, they're like, I don't really know why you're here. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I just want to <laughs> monitor like my numbers, like for yeah. my thyroid. Yeah. I'm trying to, you know, avoid going on medication as long as possible. I mean, there's probably going to be a point where, where I will. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because they're like, well, your symptoms are kind of weird. I can't really hang a hat on it. So come back in a year if it gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like so those are sort of, I've seen lots of specialists and it seems like I'm sort of in this phase where I'm probably like doing some really good preventative stuff. Um, so that's not progressing into something else because the other thing about autoimmune disease, I'm sure, you know, is once you have one, there's surely, um, another one to follow in, in the coming uh -oh. years. Is that right? I didn't know that that's a thing. That's typically what happens. I mean, so obviously when you are doing all those things in your lifestyle and your diet choices, that's, that's good because you're probably going to prevent that or slow that down. Right. Mm. And that's the other thing about, you know, lifestyle and diet is that it's not a cure, right? So a doctor might say like, well, sure you can eat healthy, but like if, it, if an autoimmune disease is going to come, it's going to come. Um, and I typically say, well, we're just slowing down the process uh, or reducing the severity when it does come. Right. Yeah. Ugh. Um, I didn't know that that was on the horizon for me. <laughs> I got to be more careful. You're scaring me now. No, I'm sorry. Kidding. More so with females because of all our hormonal stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. More so with females. But yes, typically there is another one at some point that comes down the road. But if you're doing a really good job of managing right now, then, you know, that's great too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, look, the, the, the issue here is that there's like a ladder of severity and you start with, you know, the minimal dosage of like the least harmful drug, for example, and that's fine. The problem is when, okay, now you've been upgraded to the next level. And right. then the next level after that is now maybe involving surgery. And the next level after, you know, so the idea is not to go up the ladder if you can. And right. if we can hold ourselves down, you know, minimal, I think drugs is fine. If you can get away with uh, any drugs is fine to help you be healthy, right? Right. But if we can prevent it, I mean, I, I think it seems the issue with me that I find is that I feel like some doctors have, they, they don't even care about that step. It's just the default is like, it's okay, you're not doing well on this drug, just go to the next drug. It's like, right. well, what happens when I don't do well on that drug? Am I just going to keep going up and up until I have no, no more body parts left? <laughs> Or no other options, right? Yeah. I mean, that is the other piece. Like sometimes there's not a lot of options. So it's really important to do your best to, to keep yourself away from that. And I always like say to my clients, because a lot of clients think they're going to come to me and they're going to go on an AIP diet and they're going to go off their medication. Right. So the goal is not necessarily to get you off your medication. Yeah. Like you say, it might be to switch you to a lower dose one, right? Yeah. Or one with less uh, side effects. But medication is not bad if it's preventing you from, you know, like I'll give you the example. So three years ago, um, I had an eye infection. So I'm a teacher, work with little kids. It happens sometimes, of course. Okay. And so I had got an eye infection. And so they put me on like some sort of drop antibiotic, which stimulated my immune system and my immune system decided to attack my tear glands. So this is what I mean by when you have an autoimmune disease, your immune system is sort of always like in overdrive and it can cause things like this. So I took this medication, it turned this on, and now I have been diagnosed with chronic dry eye and I have to take immunosuppressant eye drops. So I had really mixed feelings about this because I've done so well with my other autoimmune diseases that I didn't want to start taking an immunosuppressant. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Yeah. Um, and like so a, like I was really a, like, a, like a steroid, for example. Yeah, I was really worried about it because I'm like, okay, but I work in education. Like, I don't want my immune system to be not good. <laughs> you know, all these yeah, things. The good yeah. news is that it's not circulating my blood, right? But she was like, listen, like you either, if you don't take these drops, <laughs> she was like, you're going to get scar tissue on your eyes. Ugh. And then your eyesight's not going to be so great. And so I did lots of like, you know, playing around with the dosing. Like, can I reduce it? And interestingly enough, when I go to Vancouver, I have family there. I can reduce my dose in half because when I'm by the water, like my eyes are not as dry Wow. here in Alberta, it's very, very dry. Um, and so I cannot reduce my dose. I've tried several times. And so currently, you know, this is the reality, despite that I do all of these things in my diet and lifestyle. So mm. it's not 
like the end of the road. Like it's not the end of the road. If you have to take medication, sometimes it really is necessary. And I always explain that to people because I think there's a lot of guilt uh, or shame around like, Oh, I have to take medication. This didn't work. Right. So it's just trying to do the best that you can with what you've got. And if that means you still have to take medication, um, then you have to take medication. It is what it is. And that's where modern medicine, we are grateful for them. Right. Um, and there's a place for it. Right. So, um, yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that and being super transparent about that because, you know, some people might say, well, no, a hundred, it has to be a hundred percent, um, you know, non-Western, like, you know, some people have a, a chip on their shoulder, for example, uh, and it's okay to be balanced. It's okay to appreciate both sides. I'm really curious about your journey. I want to know, like, what was the aha moment that got you into this world of holistic nutrition? Uh, I know for a lot of, um, a, a lot of practitioners, they, they have their own unique stories and I'm really curious about yours. I think the listeners would, would, uh, would enjoy to hear sort of how you went from, uh, well, I mean, obviously it starts with a problem and then, and then you start looking for solutions, right? Yeah. I mean, so I, from like a very young age was, was always super sick as a kid, um, like chronic pneumonia, chronic ear infections. Um, you know, now looking back, I'm like, Oh, I think dairy was definitely playing a, <laughs> an issue there, but of course right. they didn't know that at the time. Right. Um, whenever I meet with a, a doctor now, they're like, Oh, you probably shouldn't have had dairy as a kid. Yes, probably not. Um, so I was on a lot of antibiotics, you know, in the first like seven to eight years of my life. So um, I had really severe asthma until I was about seven. And so essentially that wipes out all your good bacteria, right? Mm. Um, and there's a common misconception that you can repopulate it and then you'll be fine. So, you know, a doctor will say to you, well, take an antibiotic, but then also take a probiotic. So the thing about when you've wiped out your bacteria is that you're always going to have to take a probiotic. Like you're going to have to continually feed it. It's not going to repopulate itself. So that's also something that I've changed in my practice in the last year is to tell people, no, we need you on a probiotic like for life. That's that's really what really? we're working towards. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't know that myself. Like I always was kind of like, I'm going to take a probiotic for a while and then it should be better. And the latest research um, with my naturopath out of Australia, because I have a couple of naturopaths I work with, the latest research uh, she was showing me is saying that, yeah, we always need to be on a probiotic if we have wiped out all the bacteria. So how do you know so, if you, how do you know when you've wiped them out? Well, so typically like anybody who's been on antibiotics in the first like 10 years of your life, um, maybe say like two or three times a year, if you ever had a year like that, where you got sick a couple of times, it's essentially wiped out. It also is dependent upon your mother's, um, intestinal bacteria and how great hers was. So my mom also has a couple autoimmune diseases. So I'm assuming hers was, <laughs> was not oh, great. No. Plus I was born via cesarean. So, you know, when we talk about the bacteria and those kinds of things, they do things now to try to help with that. But back, um, when I was born, obviously that was not, um, breastfeeding helps, but then, you know, there's also been research so, that shows, you know, the gut bacteria is not much different from somebody who was bottle fed versus, so there really is just so many components here that, that we could look at, but typically if you have an autoimmune disease, you probably don't have great gut bacteria. Really? So for any, any autoimmune disease is connected to the gut almost, is that what you're saying? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, it's always something you get tested, right? You can, you know, do a stool sample test and, and see which ones are missing. That's always what I recommend if you're not having success. You know, there's a couple of good probiotics depending on what country you're in. And it's like, if I recommend those to you, but maybe then you're like, you know, having issues like constipation or the other problem, or you just feel like you're not noticing a difference. We need to be specific in which, which strains you're, you're missing. Cause that again is different. We can generalize, but it is different person to person. Um, so yeah, I essentially was really sick as a kid. I got my first autoimmune disease when I was about 11, but I was not diagnosed until I was 26. So when I say to you, like I was waiting for that diagnosis, I didn't know it was autoimmune in nature. Right. Oh. Um, so, so started, and it was like, sorry, you started it, getting symptoms when you were 11. Yes. Okay. So I attributed probably to like my parents got a divorce. It was like a very, mm. you know, traumatic thing. And mm. so I think that was the trigger probably for me. Um, and so I had always had like eczema and stuff like that, like as a kid, like lots of skin issues. Um, so then when I got diagnosed with this skin autoimmune disease, hydratinitis superativa, I was like, okay, like, and I actually had to go to the doctor, <laughs> no word of a lie and be like, this is what I have because really? Honestly, they just didn't even know what it was. Like a dermatologist would know what it is, but a general practitioner, they didn't know what it was. So they like looked it up and then they were like, 
okay, I'm going to send you to a dermatologist, but I think you're probably <laughs> right. So, and the way that I actually found out about this was my health got really bad in my early twenties when I was going to university. So I was like, you know, staying up late, like had no money. So was eating like horrible food, yep. um, you know, like pulling all nighters, living on coffee, all these things. And I started to get really bad, like stomach pains and things like that. So I went to the doctor, I was getting ultrasound. They're like, I don't know. Um, try going off coffee is actually what they said. Cause they're like, you seem to notice that it's worse after you drink coffee. So I actually went off coffee and I did feel like a little bit better, but then like crazy things started happening to my skin. I actually went a whole year where I couldn't even wear any sunscreen, you know, like the baby ones, the mineral yeah, ones, yeah, yeah. I was buying those. I was buying like expensive hundred dollar ones from the dermatologist. And my skin was just like breaking out in rashes. I couldn't use any skincare. I think I was just using like literally like Vaseline on my face because I couldn't use anything. So now looking back, that was like my immune system being in complete overdrive. Right. right. Uh, but everybody was like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then my thyroid really just like kicked the can. And again, I, I had gotten tested in my thyroid several times to this day, everything is still in normal range except for my thyroid antibodies. So I did finally get diagnosed. Um, I think it was, I want to say four years ago now with Hashimoto's when I got referred to a rheumatologist, I was like, can you just run like my thyroid antibodies? Because here in Canada, they will not run them if you are in range, like your TSH is in range. So um, now I just pay for it. And every six months I get my blood work. I pay for it through my naturopath just to keep an uh -huh. eye on it because uh -huh. I'm in range, but like my levels are not optimum so just because they're in range. So right? for our listeners, uh, can you uh, explain Hashimoto's? I know it's to do with the thyroid, isn't it? Yeah. So it's essentially yeah. where your body attacks your thyroid, right. <laughs> tries, to, tries to keep it from working. Um, so the way you're going to check if you have that is to get your thyroid antibodies checked. So it's just a blood test here in Canada. It's about $35. Um, and so I get my naturopath to order that for me. So when right. I first got tested for thyroid antibodies, I was like in the 600s. And so today, like I'm around 65 is kind of where I stay. And ideally you want to be under 20. Okay. I have not been able to get it under 50. Um, but I feel pretty good, even though I am like above 50. So it's again, it's different person to person. And it can change throughout throughout your life, depending on what's going on, particularly for women, right? Like different hormonal phases of our life. Right. Um, and it's definitely probably the most common disease that I work with um, right. is Hashimoto's. Um, so yeah, I basically was just like doing really, really not well in all areas health wise. I had no energy, all those things. Um, and then I got a teaching job and I literally went to sleep every day around 5 PM because I was so exhausted and had yeah. no energy. So I stayed up late one weekend and I was researching, um, trying to find out like what the heck was going on. And I found this book called the hidden plague. And this lady had written a book. She had hydroitinitis superativa as well. And when she was describing it to me, I was like, oh my gosh, that is what I've had since I was like 11 years old. And she then talked about how she put it into remission with this diet called the paleo autoimmune protocol. So I don't even know, like people talk about these like epiphany moments in their life. Um, I was one of those people my whole life who was like, you can sleep when you're dead. Like, <laughs> like, or like, just eat the cake, like yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm the farthest thing from being like any sort of health guru in any way. And when I read that book, I was like, holy man, I have to do this diet. And so I started looking into it and I was like, whoa, this is like the most extreme diet I've ever, like ever right. done in my life. And so I actually took three months before I started. So people always ask me this question, like, did you just like jump in or how did you do it? Because the first thing I ever teach when I'm working with a client is mindset, because mm. to do this diet successfully, it is all about the mindset. Right. So you, you, so, re you read the book and then, and then you had to work up the, the courage to actually yes. do it. So it was like, yeah. Oh my gosh, I, okay. I was like, okay, what are all the foods I need to eat? Like before I go on this diet. And I know that sounds silly because the diet says you only need to do it for 30 to 90 days. But in some way, like in my head, I knew that this was going to be like my new life and that I was never going to be able to go back and eat just like McDonald's and whatever, right? right? So right. Literally like, okay, red velvet cheesecake, like, you know, all of these things that right. I was like, I have to eat. So I took this three months <laughs> to like make sure I was mentally preparing. Like, you know, I drank alcohol. I was like, okay, because that's probably not going to be a thing. And I, you know, and not that I completely like went off the deep end, but I just made sure that I had done all these things. Like, oh, I went and had my favorite pizza from this place and whatever. So I did that. 
And then I was like, cause when I start this, I'm going like all in. So yeah. I am kind of one of those like cold Turkey people. A lot of my clients will say, Oh, I, I want to ease in. I don't want to give up coffee yet or this. I'm like an all or nothing type person myself. Right. So then I just jumped in and I actually had to do it for eight months. And I know that scares a lot wow. of people. Um, but I was in like, I mean, when I explained to you, like what my skin was like, I mean, when you are seeing like rashes on your skin, it literally means there is like, you know, a total sh- storm inside yeah. your body when you are seeing yeah. that. So my body was not in a good place at all. And so eight months of healing, I mean, I've had an autoimmune disease since I was 11. To me, that's a small price to pay, like when you consider, and it completely, completely changed my life. So I had like, because my thyroid was not doing well, I had gained a bunch of weight, like in those two years there. So I actually lost like 80 pounds in that eight months. Um, just, strictly that, through diet. Like strictly I was not doing diet. any sort of okay. exercise or anything. And people always ask me about that. Why didn't, um, why didn't you? Because it seems like a lot of people would go to that as well. Like I know with my colitis, as stupid as it sounds to get into remission, I was like, I need to bring more blood to my stomach colon area. So I'm going to do a bunch of ab work at the gym. And so I just be doing ab work over and over again. I'm like, if something's going to happen with this, but well, why, I guess why didn't you come to that uh, idea? Cause so many people do. Right. So, I mean, being a, you know, a female growing up, like, you know, in the early two thousands, of course, you're, you're no uh, stranger to dieting or diet culture or, right. you know, working out and all those things. So when you have a thyroid issue, essentially your body, you know, views working out as stress. Mm. And so what happens is then your body will actually store, store fat and your energy levels when you have a thyroid issue are typically so, so low that it's all you can do to get out of bed. And I talked about how I would go to bed Mm. at like 5 PM. So um, I just did not have the energy to be able to meal prep and do all of these like things that I was doing, um, other than like, just go for like a walk with so a you, you, were, you were in a perpetual flare up is what was going yes. on. Yeah. Okay. Like for like two years, I think. Yeah. That's <laughs> it awful. Was, like, it got to a point where it was like so bad and I didn't even know what it felt like to feel normal. Mm. Like I really, I really didn't. And I mean, being in your early twenties and saying like, man, like when I sit like for an hour, like I'm stoved up, like my yeah. joints hurt, you know, when I, when I wake up in the morning, like that, a lot of people, when you talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, that's how I feel. But they don't even realize that that's not normal or yeah. that they shouldn't feel that way yeah. at this point. Right. And I had just accepted that as like, oh, well, I think I just have bad genes and you know, this is the reality. I mean, that is, you know, with thyroid issues, you are going to have joint pain and, and low energy and all of those things. Um, my eyebrows, like particularly my left one, like essentially the end, like fell out. I mean, those are all signs of thyroid issues. And I would continue to go to my doctors and they were like, you're in range. Right. I was like, awesome. But I feel like crap. So you just come to normalize that like you're deemed for a life of feeling like crap. I mean, that is essentially how you feel. So when I found this, like I tell you, literally, I knew it was going to change my life. Like I've never felt so sure about something. I'll even say like, I wasn't this, this sure about marrying my husband. <laughs> as I was doing this diet. Like I just knew it was going to change my life. And that's why yeah. I had to get so ready. And, and then I just committed to it. Now, when I did those eight months, I say eight months before I had a successful reintroduction. Right. So I was trying to do reintroductions probably too soon because, mm. you know, everything you read says 30 to 90 days. Um, so after 30 days, I was like, okay, like I'm going to try this, but I, in hindsight, I should not have, because I didn't even start to feel better until three months in. What happens, what happens if you don't reintroduce, you just, you just stick with a very restrictive diet. So that's, I mean, that's a common question because a lot of people have fear around that myself included when I went through it. I mean, I've done the reintroduction process like 15 times. It's like you start to feel good. So once you actually start to feel good and like my energy levels went up and I lost weight and I like, you know, my hair was growing back, all these things. I was like, Holy man, like why would I want to try to like eat any of that stuff? It clearly got me in this in the first place. But I mean, a a restrictive diet is one for your mindset, not great because socially, like one of the hardest parts about this diet is like, it's hard to go out and eat with people. It's hard to go to someone's house. It's hard to entertain. Um, So you really feel like you're kind of alone and kind of isolated. And so that's the first reason. But the other reason, of course, is that nutrient density. I mean, when we are, when I'm saying tomatoes are bad for me in particular, I don't do well with nightshades. They might not be for you. So we want to expand the diet and have as much nutrients as possible. And the focus of the autoimmune protocol is actually nutrient density. So we try to get you to eat lots of different foods that you've probably never even tried before. 
like switch it up like every week, eat a different type of green, right? right. Try something you haven't tried before that's on the approved list because we're trying to flood the body with nutrients. We don't want to restrict it forever, right? right? It's just a temporary thing to figure out what works for you and what doesn't. And then you can kind of move on. And so basically you end up with this personalized yeah. AIP diet that's specific for you. You're never going to like go back to the old way or else you're going to, your symptoms will return. For me, I eat like most paleo foods with the exception of nightshades. So nightshades for me and most people with any sort of skin autoimmune disease don't do well with nightshades or anybody with any sort of um, rheumatology type thing. So like rheumatoid arthritis yeah. or Trogans or something like that typically don't do well with nightshades, but again, it is individual. And so I can eat like at a paleo restaurant, but I have to say like no tomatoes, no peppers, no eggplant, right? Like just yeah. to kind of keep it, but that's my own personalized version. And the reason that I actually was so unsuccessful with reintroductions for so long is because I actually had SIBO. So when I talk about like, there's an underlying thing happening. So what I do when I work with clients is I say like, okay, we're going to do this AIP diet, you know, for, I like to do 60 days just because like I said, you know, 30 days is a really short amount of time. It's so, and if that's so short. Time, it's very short. Yeah. Yeah. If you've been sick for a long time, it, we typically need to do it longer, but we also don't want to stay in there too long. Mm -hmm. So anything over three months, then I say, okay, if we're not able to reintroduce anything, like anything, then we probably have some other sort of thing going on that we need to test for. And that's where testing comes in really handy. You're going to work with a naturopath or a functional medicine practitioner and find out. So do a GI test, you know, do a stool, stool sample test um, and find out what's going on. And typically there is like the most common things are some sort of stomach infection, um, like H. pylori, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, SIBO, like small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. That's a really, really common one, particularly for people who have done a lot of antibiotics in their life. Okay. Um, that's a common one. And then candida overgrowth or like a yeast overgrowth is also very common. And when you have one of those things going on, um, you're not going to be able to successfully reintroduce foods. So then you're stuck in this limbo of like, I can't reintroduce anything. I guess I'll just stay on the diet forever. Right. right? Which is not good either. Cause yeah. it's a really this feeling. So yeah. if you do a diet like this and after three months, you are not able to reintroduce anything. I encourage you to, to do some testing and seek out working with someone yeah. so that you can figure out what the underlying problem is. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but if you have, you know, one of those additional issues, you're going to uh, get like false negatives, if you will, because you haven't really gone to the, to the root of the problem. Right. Um, and then you have and to restart again. Yes. And typically the people that I work with are the people who have some sort of other underlying issue, but I have a lot of people who do my like online program where they just do it by themselves and it walks them through how to do the AIP diet and they experience huge success. So it's not that everybody is a, is a specific case, but a lot of people are, and that's why you need to work with someone if you are one of those people. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that just isn't correct. Like, I mean, I was just sifting through for like five years trying to figure out like, is this food allowed? Is it not? Why? You know, all those things. It's so nice to have someone where you can just like send them a text and say like, can I eat this? And they're like, no, because blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. Like, right. You don't have to like <laughs> cause all that because one of the biggest issues with starting the autoimmune protocol or probably the biggest one is time. So typically if you have an autoimmune disease, your energy levels are probably not great. Yeah. Um, you're probably a busy person. That's kind of, you know, part of what gets you into sort yeah, of having an right. autoimmune disease is that we're not taking care of ourselves. Right. And so the biggest thing is time. And so people will say like, I just, I can't go pick something up on my lunch break or, you know, I have to meal prep and I, I have no energy. So that's really the biggest part. And that's why that mindset piece is so important. Cause it's like, this is just for a temporary stitch in time, but let's rely on these people like myself who have done it the wrong way. Right. <laughs> and if out what's the most time efficient way. So my slogan is actually that I work with people who are busy. That's what I say, because I like, I'm a teacher, I'm assistant principal. I have like no time. I always like say so that. So when do you do the, when so, do you do this work? <laughs> on the weekends and in the evenings. <laughs> That's so crazy. right now Good I'm for you. Vacation, right? Good yeah. for you. Yeah, you are right. Um, and so most of my clients are really good. They're always like, Oh, you have a meeting. It's okay. We'll work around it. We'll change the time. And I always am upfront about that. I, I mean, I do this work solely for the purpose that it brings me joy to help people wow. like in a way that I wish there was someone that had helped me and that I had 
you know, when I first started AIP, like I said, there wasn't much out there. Now there's like such a, such a plethora of recipes and people that you can work with specific even to your autoimmune disease, right? Like I work with really anybody with autoimmune disease. I would say most of my clients have some sort of thyroid issue, mm -hmm. but just in general, you can find someone specific, you know, that's going to, you know, be working with colitis or Crohn's and they like know everything about that specifically and they're going to help you. So I do encourage you if you can't afford it to do that because, I wasted a lot of time sort of right. trying to do it myself and I didn't really have the time and it probably wasn't helping in terms of lifestyle. What do you, because what, what do you say, know. what do you say to people, Megan, who are like, well, I'm smarter and better and, you know, clever and I can figure it out by myself. Um, <laughs> is the answer sure do your thing or like, please don't be a masochist and just go get the help you need. Well, like I say, I always encourage you, you know, you can give it a try on your own, but after three months, you need to seek some help if right. you're not experiencing um, an improvement. Most people will still experience some improvement, even if they're doing it on their own. But if you're not, it means you're doing something not right. One of the biggest things when I work with people is they are not doing the lifestyle pieces. Mm -hmm. I was guilty of this. So I told you, I just literally changed my diet and I felt like a million times better over the course of those eight months but I still was not feeling like a hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, I don't feel a hundred percent every day. I don't want to like tell people like, this is a cure. Yeah, well, who, it's who, not. who does, who does? <laughs> yeah. Like some days you're like, eh, it's more like an 80 today. Right. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's really important that you um, do seek out help if you need it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting a frog in my throat. Um, <laughs> that you do seek out help if you need it because those lifestyle pieces. So sleep, like if you are not sleeping well, it doesn't matter what you eat. And when I tell people that they really don't want to hear that, but yeah. it is the truth. Yeah. It's like, you know, so honestly, like I'll work with clients where literally they've got the diet piece down pat, you know, and we're talking about, okay, how do you get your teenage sons to help you do some dishes? So you don't have so many dishes to do. Okay. How do we get your husband to, you know, do the carpool yeah. so that you can do your meditating in the morning? Like literally these are the things that people have more trouble with than they ever do with the diet. And when I, you know, went to the Canadian school of natural nutrition, they kept telling me, Megan, you're not going to be really talking about food that much when you do this work. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm going to focus on the AIP diet. That's my thing. Like I love making recipes and they were totally right. It's always the lifestyle pieces that I'm talking with people. I'm like, okay. So tonight you need to go to bed at 11.45, 11.45. Okay. That's five minutes earlier than the night before. And then I talked to them the next day and they're like, yeah. I didn't go to bed at 11.45. Like yeah. these, we are our own worst enemies. And so, you know, in order to heal, you got to sleep a lot. Like that's the only time your body's going to heal. If you are inflamed, you need to be sleeping. And so those pieces are actually what I work on more so with people. So, you know, even if you start to feel a bit better in those three months, but you're like, something is not right. It's probably something you're not even noticing that I'm going to point out to you and say like, hmm, you don't sleep that well, or your stress is a little bit, Hey, like we probably need to work on reducing that a little bit or managing it. Right. right. And I'm very realistic in my approach as well, because, um, I love my work. Like I love being an educator. Um, it's a very like, you know, giving job where <laughs> you're doing a lot of things on, on extra time. Yeah. Uh, that you're paid for. And so I really have to watch the stress management piece. That's my Achilles heel. Right. Sleep I'm pretty good about, but the stress management piece. And so I just say to people, Hey, like, yeah, stress is going to come. We cannot prevent that, but we can change how we respond to it and how we manage it. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I agree with that hundred percent. And and there's actually a book uh, called never split the difference. And it's about an FBI negotiator. And he says, well, everything is a negotiation. And so I'm not surprised that despite your commitment to wanting to focus on the diet, a lot of the conversations you have with clients are probably to do with helping them negotiate the other things going on in their life. Um, I, yes, I, absolutely. I, another question I have for you that I just thought about actually, as you were talking is, um, you know, for some people who have like the heavier medication that they take to reduce the inflammation in their body, let's say, for example, like Remicades is like the injections that you get for if you have like Crohn's or colitis or something. Um, and that's sort of like, you know, the, the level where the, the, the less powerful medication didn't work. So you had right. to, you had to go to that. That's what, that would be like my upgrade if I were, if I were to do that. 
Um, and with that, you can actually get away with a lot more. That's sort of part of the pitch. It's like you don't have to have, you know, as re restrictive of a diet. You can eat this thing and that thing because this this drug will magically reduce the inflammation. What um, I don't know if you do you have experience with that, but it, what is the actual protocol there? Do you still need to stick with a restrictive diet or are you damaging yourself while this drug is magically healing you? How, how does that actually work? Is it is it a deception? What's going on there? Yeah, you know, that's a good question, because I think a lot of people are sort of stuck in that state. In fact, just people in general if they don't have symptoms. So, you know, like their yeah. blood work might show one thing and they're like, but I feel great. Like I eat everything and I don't have any pain. I don't have any inflammation, you know, all those things. Um, and yet the markers are clearly saying, <laughs> saying otherwise. Right. Um, so I've always been really lucky in that I have like pretty immediate symptoms. So okay. I know if I'm like not feeling, feeling my best, but there are a ton of people that I've worked with um, you know, they don't really know how to judge things because they, they're not really in tune with their body. Um, and I think that's sort of something that's happened in the last like 30 years. Like we've sort of just kind of become desensitized to, to how we actually feel. We don't, you know, we don't listen to when we're hungry, um, or when we're tired, we just power through, uh, and then we're like, Oh, I'm not even hungry anymore. Or, you know, the people that say to me, like, when I get eight hours of sleep, I feel more tired than when I get like five. So I just <laughs> roll on five because <laughs> I feel best. It's like, I don't think you're really in tune with your body. Like you're saying yeah, that yeah, they yeah. don't actually are. Right. And so, yeah. you know, these medications, I mean, okay, so they're going to get rid of those symptoms so that you, you think you are not feeling that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but you cannot like outrun that. Right. Like you, you know, if you eat McDonald's every day, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on McDonald's, but I'm just yeah. saying like, yeah. let's say we can, we can, I'm okay with picking. Right? McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you, let's, if you're going to eat fast food every day, like, and you know, people say like my cholesterol is good. Like I haven't gained any weight. I have lots of energy. You know, they're saying all those things that that is a temporary thing. Like eventually right. you will feel the impacts. There is no one, no one that can go completely unscathed their entire life from living a bad lifestyle. You just can't. There are those of us that really have to dial it up and it sucks mm -hmm. to be in that club. Yeah. <laughs> like yep. Part of the worst club. But there are people who, you know, can can definitely do a lot more bad things <laughs> lifestyle wise and, yeah. and feel less than say like, you know, I do a little slip up like you're saying at the holidays and I eat like stuff for two days and then I feel like crap for a week. Um, you know, so we're all, it's all in fairness. Everybody has their things, right? But you cannot take a medication. Like, I mean, without some sort of, impact like so i don't know what the side effects are of some of yeah. these medications but like there are like if you read them you'd probably be shocked right um and so you know you might be temporarily reducing your inflammation but like you cannot outrun that yeah there, there just there is no way around that so that is for people who are not there yet Got so it. i do a screening call with every single person that i work with and believe it or not i do tell people you're not ready to work with me <laughs> Um, yeah. I can tell in the first like five minutes of talking to them if, if, if they're ready or not, because if you are not ready, like, I don't want to take your money. I don't want to waste my time, like trying to convince you that you need to do these things. Yeah. You need to get to a point where you feel so bad. I know this sounds terrible, but you feel so bad that you're like, this is the only way, like I have to go somewhere from here. Well, right. And, 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 and so I was going to say like in, in business, there's a saying like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to win? And then the same thing here is like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to feel healthy? Right. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And a lot of people will like do a 30 day stint on the AIP. You know, they feel better. They might lose some weight or gain some weight, depending on whatever their goal was, right. Depending on their autoimmune disease. Um, but then they just go back to like how they were before. Mm. Uh, and then like in a year or so, they're like, oh, like, I think I'm going to come see you again. <laughs> Can you send me a meal plan? I'm kind of feeling like whatever. And they yeah. do a lot of this back and forth until they reach a point where they're like, no more. Right. Yeah. But you have to arrive there on your own. And so, you know, if you're taking those medications, there's, there's no judgment to you that, you know, you're using that right now, but it really is just a crutch, right? Got it. You're not to, to the root cause of this or to, you know, you're just masking sort of those symptoms temporarily. And I mean, sometimes that's okay until you're ready to, to be in a place where you're, you're going to actually put in the effort. Cause there is no shortcuts here. As right. you know, if there was right. Yeah. You know, maybe we, one day, maybe one day there'll be some shortcuts, but for now we got to stick to the plan. And, and, and so how long is, you know, a period with you, for example, to really recalibrate the body, the mind, is that what, like four months, six months? Um, yeah, so I have like two different packages. So 
um, either like a six weeks or a 12 week package. Um, so, you know, a lot of people will start with a six week one and then they, they, you know, extend it for another six weeks type of thing. Um, and that's generally how I do it, but I also recommend them first to do my sort of either one of my group coaching classes, cause it's more affordable. Um, and you have the camaraderie of a community or I have them, you know, if you're more of like a self-paced kind of person, you're not a group person. Um, then essentially I have them do, um, one of my like DIY courses. It's kind of like that's what I call it anyway, but it's like basically where you go through 30 days uh, with me kind of as your coach and you can email me along the way. Um, and that's also a much more affordable option. I know like right now, particularly after coming out of a pandemic or even through the pandemic, um, I created a DIY version because I knew people like money was tight. Right. Um, so having them have that option to do it like that. Some people are like, no, I need to to meet with you. I actually always try to like undersell. I'll say, I think you could just do my DIY program. And they're like, no, I really need the accountability. I need to, uh, to talk to you every day. And I'm like, are you sure? I think you can do it. Yeah, um, but yeah. yeah, a lot of people are like, no, no, I, I definitely need that. So depending on who you are, right. There's, there's something out there for everyone. I mean, I have tons of meal plans. So yeah. the DIY version is based on my group coaching program, but you can sort of just work through it self-paced um so you know there's weekly video tutorials where i teach you about those lifestyle pieces like mindset and sleep and movement and stress management because you know you talked about exercise exercise for people with autoimmune disease looks very different particularly right. when you're in a flare right yeah um so more is not always better <laughs> no definitely not in a flare i mean it, to me it was almost impossible to have any real exercise plan yeah. like walking two blocks is like all i could do for the whole day when i'm in like peak flare up um yeah, I have a ton of stories about that, but we don't need to get into that right now. But definitely when you're in remission or when you're when you're in the period of, you know, there there's not just flare up and remission. There's a flare up and then there's the road to remission. <laughs> and so the road to remission, I think you can introduce exercise most definitely, but Yes. And it'll be different again. Like I, I know we've talked a lot about this is it is individualized. Like you can't look at somebody and say, "Oh, they have the same autoimmune disease as me and they can do CrossFit." Right. I mean, you could have this and you're like, oh, I cannot do CrossFit. Like for me, yeah. I have to rewatch cardio um, because my body really views that as stress and it can throw my thyroid numbers out. So, I mean, it doesn't mean I do no cardio, but I have to be really cautious and do short bursts of it rather than like, say, 30 minutes or an hour, like, you know, what, what you maybe we're used to doing. So everything is kind of um, individualized. But I always say start with like that basic training. Um, and then, you know, after the three months, if you're like, okay, I'm not seeing results, then, then do work with somebody. Um, and you know, that's where my packages come in of like a Got you it. Know, six week, twelve weeks. Yeah. So, um, people can go to your website. It's all about AIP.com. I T S all A L L about AIP.com. And I think they can get your, your free seven day AIP meal plan. They can just get started like that. Right. Yeah. And I also send them the yes and no food list. So they know like what foods they can have and which ones they can't. Yeah. Perfect. There's so much content on your website. I mean, we, we honestly didn't even get to that much today. There's so much to talk about. Like the final question I have for you is how do you find going out to eat? How do you find dining out with an AIP? Um, or I mean, not AIP, but, but the, the, the current custom version of your diet that you're following um, what do you do? Do you have your favorites? Are you guessing? Are you parsing the menu? Are you calling restaurants? What's your what's your go to strategy? Um, so I actually just posted um, a post on this today, how to dine out while you're on the AIP. So if you go oh. to my website, you'll see that. But um, yeah, this is a question that I always get asked about a lot. It's really hard when you're in that elimination phase, but it can be done. And I've kind of got some tips on there. And then when you're like me and you're sort of in this maintenance phase um, that's sort of ever changing, you know, sometimes you can have this food, sometimes yeah. you can, or you can have it in small amounts. Um, typically what I do is just try to go to a restaurant that is kind of like a, like a steakhouse or somewhere that has seafood, because those are going to be the easiest foods for you to manipulate because they're cooked fresh. Okay. <laughs> so in today's, you know, a modern sort of society, it's like a lot of stuff is like pre-marinated. And when you're on a diet like mine where, you know, and I can't have like, paprika or chili powder yeah. like stuff like that it's really hard to to not have that um i would say it's gotten a lot better in the last five years so when you go to a restaurant you know like a lot of times i just really roll up i mean i'll say to you it's good to call ahead and stuff but sometimes like it's life you're out with people and they're like hey do you want to get lunch and you're like sure yeah um so i just go you know i'm looking up the menu on my phone 
trying to be like, okay, where's the gluten-free stuff? Cause that's the, the hard no for me. Cause I'll get really sick if I have gluten. Yeah. So I'm looking and then I'm kind of like, okay, how can I tailor this? The biggest thing I ever learned is that it's hard to order on diet like mine, just straight off the menu. So you're going to look at something and say like, can I get this cooked plain? Can right. I get this without anything marinated? Right. Like that's what you're going to modifications. Yes. And yeah. so it is tricky, but you do get better uh, at doing it. And like you say, technology, um, you know, has really helped with that. Um, the one thing I really wish, though, that restaurants would do is they need to have more ingredient transparency because it's really hard. And I'm going to give you this story that happened to me last week. Yeah. So I was with my parents and they were like, can we go to this is our favorite restaurant? Can we go here? Can you eat here? And I'm like, sure, I'll make it work like whatever. So there was four things on the menu that were gluten free. And I was like, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick a steak because that's easy. So I'm like, okay, like no gluten, like, you know, no uh, cow dairy. And they're like, okay, so the girl was really good. Like she came back out and said, we brush the steak with butter. So you don't want us to do that. And I was like, No. And then she's like, Okay, the vegetables, you know, in butter. No. Okay, can you do olive oil? Okay, sure. Um, you know, and so I just kind of talked to her about that. And then I said, instead of potatoes, because potatoes are nightshade, and I can't have them. Yeah, I said, Can you just give me like a green salad? (laughs) She was like, yeah, for sure. And I was like, you know, so just like plain green salad. I said like, there's no tomatoes in it. And she's like, no, no, there's no tomatoes. Yeah. I'm like, no dressing, you know, anyway. So yeah. I say, oh, I get this salad that comes out and it's like, you know, it's got like feta cheese on yeah, it, yeah. like some sort of like dried cranberries, like, uh, like sort of candied nuts. Like, I'm like, what kind of green salad is this? Like, this is a fancy salad. Yeah. So, you know, word to the wise, I gave it to my dad and he ate it. Um, it's just like, you never you know too cautious, right? It's like, yeah. so I assumed a green salad is a green salad, but yeah. Not well, that's, right? that's where, and not to plug my own company, but that's what, that's what we do here at Honeycomb is try to get more ingredient transparency, uh, from restaurants by making it easier for them to actually label the information. Cause it does take a lot of time. And so mm-hmm. with the AI that we've put together, just to assist them in the annotation of all that information that they have to do in an easy way that they can show to their customers. So we don't have to play what we call ingredient Tetris with the servers. Um, so, or sometimes it's ingredient Tetris and other times it's Russian roulette. And sometimes we just have to take a chance. So uh, that's a wonderful story and it makes a lot of, I mean, wonderful in the sense that it, it shows what needs to be improved proved on in the industry, but not necessarily wonderful for, for you as a customer. Um, but, uh, in, in any case, it was a, a real pleasure speaking with you, Megan, um, really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I feel like we could go on for hours and hours, like a Joe Rogan three hour podcast, but I know, right? <laughs> um, may, maybe on the next one, uh, any, any last things that you want to say before we wrap up? No, I just wanted to say, um, you know, that I think your um, what you guys are doing is so amazing because that is such a big stressor for people on a diet like mine is to go out and eat. So the fact that you're trying to make it easier, uh, cause you don't want to be that annoying person that's asking the server like 5,000 questions. Yeah. <laughs> so I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, anybody in this industry that's, you know, trying to make it easier for those of us, uh, living with dietary restraints or allergies or, you know, autoimmune disease. So thanks so much for having me. Um, and if you guys ever needed any help with AIP, definitely reach out to me. Um, I usually respond within 24 hours. So if you have a question, feel free to reach out. Cool. Brilliant. Honeycomb is a mobile app that works with your iPhone or Android device to help you find suitable food to eat at restaurants near you based on your specific dietary requirements. If you're plant-based and celiac, low FODMAP with a tree nut allergy, keto and dairy-free, we support countless dietary combinations and profiles. Based on your inputs, Honeycomb curates the best restaurants for you and the best options to order at those restaurants. If you have more severe allergies, don't worry. Honeycomb only recommends you places that have a clear protocol to deal with cross-contamination. Pre-order Honeycomb today at get.honeycomb.ai.